Thank you very much, Dr. Funk. And I very much appreciate being invited to this very beautiful city and to this very impressive young university, which really has, uh, really, in terms of psychoanalysis, something that I think was needed. However, we are meeting today in the context of extreme violence throughout the world, the unchecked spread of weapons of mass destruction, resistance to respond to climate change and to the threat of the environment, to the long-term human survival on this planet, and the lack of visionary and ethical leadership that we need. The list goes on. We urgently need to understand the causes of these problems if we're going to be able to mobilize solutions. But our current theories are inadequate. The most influential theories in contemporary scholarship have a great deal to teach us about microprocesses of perception and emotions framed in the cognitive and neuroscience. They have little to say either about the power of emotions from a depth psychological perspective or economic, political, and cultural structures and dynamics. The social sciences do address these larger structures and institutions that shape our world, but do so in ways that marginalize serious analysis of emotions and what Eric Fromm called the social character. To improve the world, we need to understand and address both the causes of social pathology and the factors that will further human growth. On the one hand, we need to understand the roots of violence, the escapes from freedom, the commercialization of culture. On the other hand, we need to leverage the models that do produce collaboration and human happiness, being versus having. To develop this kind of understanding, there is no better place to start than with the work of Eric Fromm. This evening, I will first describe Fromm's scientific contributions, then research that has built on them, and finally the work that needs to be done so that Fromm's contributions can further improve our understanding of both human and socioeconomic development. Now, this lecture is available uh, in full and both in English and Dr. Funk has translated it into German, so I'm not going to read every bit of it. You, you can do that. Um, but I will try to describe the main elements. But let me start out that in July 1960, just having received the doctorate from Harvard with my newly married wife, Sandy Lee, we drove thousands of kilometers from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Mexico. Uh, I had a fellowship from the, our National Institutes of Mental Health to do both research and training with Dr. Fromm. Um, for eight years, I worked with Fromm as a student and colleague and another 10 years where we met and corresponded regularly. Fromm helped me personally to understand myself, to develop a philosophy of life that has guided my work and my relationships, and to acquire theoretical and scientific knowledge that I've employed in my own research, writing, and teaching. Fromm told me he had four purposes for the Mexican study. They were, one, to test and establish scientific evidence for the theory of social character. Number two, to understand what causes the social pathologies of alcoholism and violence in Mexican villages, and what, on the other hand, leads to sustainable development in a peasant society 
And as the work went on, it really, we, we, were, we began to look broadly at the relevance of what we saw in this peasant society, in peasant societies throughout the world. Three, to understand what is needed to facilitate develop, individual development in a peasant society. And four, to give something back to Mexico, which had welcomed him and had supported his work. <clears throat> I believe the study published in our book, Social, Social Character in a Mexican Village, achieved Fromm's four purposes. But before describing his scientific contributions, I'd like to just note the definition of science. There are many definitions of science uh, that we've heard. The Oxford Dictionary defines science as theoretical perception of a truth as contrasted with moral conviction, which uh, a definition which reflects uh, the truth that facts without theory can never be tested. Science starts with theory. And uh, so, you know, to make, to make a long discussion short, I would, the point is that science has to do with testable theories, with evidence, um, and Fromm, in his work on social character, met all the criteria that I've been able to find of what is considered science. So let me start out with what, what, what Fromm tested in terms of the theory of social character. The theory really grew out of an earlier research project here in Germany. From 1929 to 31, Fromm and collaborators studied the political attitudes of German factory and office workers. In a letter to Fromm in 1974, I asked him, why did he take, undertake this study? What was his motive? And he wrote back, quote, our main motive was that we wanted to know how many of the workers and employees would in fact resist the Nazis, in spite of the fact that it seemed obvious that they would to many people who were impressed by the strength of the social democratic and communist organizations. I thought that the only way to find out was to study their character, that is to say the relationship between anti-Nazi opinion and the real character structure. Point Fromm often made is, what's the difference between opinions and convictions? Opinions are things that can change with the tides of life. Convictions are things that stand, whatever is happening. Using a questionnaire that he could interpret psychologically, Fromm contrasted the conscious political attitudes with unconscious attitudes to authority. And the study showed that men holding similar, it was only men that he studied, holding similar leftist views had very different emotional attitudes to authority. Some are what he called humanistic revolutionaries. Those are people he thought would really resist the Nazis, who had a deep humanistic conviction of, of make, making a good society. Some were authoritarian rebels, who felt really, even though they might maintain a socialist ideology, they were looking to create a new, a, a new autocratic uh, state. You know, like the communists. And, and some, uh, unfortunately, the majority, lacked really deep conviction. Fromm reasoned that only the humanistic revolutionaries would resist the National Socialists, the authoritarians would join the Nazis, and the others would fall in line with whoever was in power. Fromm concluded from this study that the Nazis came to power, the left lacked the unity and conviction to resist them. And he also theorized that people holding the same political views often had different social characters because their personalities were shaped in different cultural contexts. Building on this study, Fromm began to, he began to develop a theory of social character as a way of integrating theories of Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud. 
In 1962, he wrote, Marx postulated the independence, be, interdependence between the economic basis of society and the political and legal institutions, philosophy, art, religion, etc. The former, according to Marxist theory, determined the latter, the ideological superstructure, which was determined deeply by the social conditions, particularly the mode of production. And this laid out very well in the German ideology. But Marx and Engels did not show, as Engels admitted quite explicitly, how the economic basis would be translated into the ideological superstructure, if you follow. In other words, they had a theory these were connected, but they didn't show how the connection was made. From went on, I believe that by using the tools of psychoanalysis, this gap in Marxian theory can be filled, and that economic basis structure and the superstructure are connected. One of these connections lies in what I have called the social character. It's very important, if you want to understand Fromm, to see the, how his theory came from research and also from questioning uh, two great thinkers where he could see that, that both lacked something, that he could find a way of integrating the missing link. A key element of social character is Freud's dynamic and systemic concept of character. Freud modified, Fromm modified and added to Freud's description of three normal character types. It's really, it's very interesting. It's only found in one small article Freud wrote on normal, the normal character. And he had three types. <clears throat> the erotic type, where the main interest is loving and more particularly being loved. This type is dominated by the fear of losing love, therefore especially dependent on others from whom they seek love. Second, the obsessive type. type this type has a strong superego dominated by the fear of conscience rather than the fear of losing love. Freud saw this type as self-reliant, quote, the conservative pillar of civilization. By the way, he also saw combinations of these types. Um, <clears throat> and third, <clears throat> the narcissistic type. The chief interest is directed to self-maintenance. Superego is weak. These individuals are independent and little intimidated. In describing the normal narcissist, Freud wrote, Quote, people of this type impress others as personalities and are particularly fitted to serve as support for others, to assume the role of leadership, to add new stimulus to cultural development and attack the existing order. Freud saw himself as this type. He even said so uh, if you look at uh, some of the notebooks of Ferenczi. Uh, at one point, Ferenczi says to Freud, you don't seem very sympathetic. And Freud said, no, I'm a narcissist. In contrast to Freud, who theorized that these types were formed by the structuring of obedient ties in childhood, from theorized the types were ways of relating to the world to satisfy both survival, material needs, and to relate to others. In other words, to survive both material, materially and emotionally. And as we have heard, he felt these types, rather than being structured uh, in childhood through uh, libidinal attachments, etc., cetera, um, were shaped by socialization mediated by family, schooling, work, and play. He also stated that each type can be more productive, more active, self-directed, responsible, loving, or unproductive, passive, dependent, driven by internal drives. 
Fromm's ideal of a fully productive person combined love and creative work. He termed Freud's erotic type receptive with a pos positive quality of caring for others. He termed the obsessive type hoarding with positive qualities of patience, practicality, and tenacity, and negative qualities, stubbornness, and stinginess. And he termed the narcissistic type exploitative, adding to Franz positive qualities the negatives of arrogance, seduction, and exploitation. Now, Fromm saw these types as changing according to the social character. In other words, they were really nuclei of a social character which was formed by all the cultural, uh, political institutions. So that when Freud observed personalities in the early 20th century, the obsessives were the dominant type, the model for character development. Uh, their personality fit with the social character formed in the era both of craft, work, and the bureaucratic industrial mode of production. But you could see a difference be between an obsessive uh, farmer who had to hoard to protect himself from changes in the weather, the market, etc., versus the, um, the hoarding bureaucrat who is ruled by bosses and clocks and and roles that he fit and had to do, follow the rules and so on, and look for his autonomy within the role. As the mode of production and cultural frame shifted from manufacturing to service mode of production, Fromm observed that a new personality type was emerging to adapt to the service economy. And he called this chameleon-like type the marketing personality. It has, in fact, become the dominant personality type of a new social character that I have termed the interactive social character. The productive marketing type combines a certain amount of independence with interactivity. But flexible to the point of being protean, marketing types adapt easily to changing situations. The negative traits include a lack of a center, insincerity, and disloyalty. And I'll say more about this because I've been seeing in a lot of research over the last 10 years, more and more people are fitting this model. In the Mexican study, we define social character as follows. <clears throat> the concept of social character does not refer to the complete or highly individualized, in fact, unique character structure as it exists in an individual, but to a character syndrome of character traits, which is developed as an adaptation to the economic, social, and cultural conditions common to the group. Now, the con contra let me just, I want to just describe two scientific contributions from the Mexican study that have proven statistically significant and explanatory and really useful for looking at um, problems of peasant personality throughout the world. At the start of the study, Fromm raised the following question. What happened to the peasant farmers, the campesinos, after the Mexican Revolution of 1910-20? Despite the fact that they were all given land, many peasants failed to take advantage of their opportunities. Instead, there was an increase of alcoholism and a high inc incidence of violence. Why did this happen? The study showed the importance of social character in explaining the fa failure of development. And let me just say that <clears throat> what it showed was there were really three different social characters in the Mexican village. And some had been independent, free farmers, peasants, and they had a very, tended to have a productive, obsessive personality. They were able to take advantage of their opportunities. Another type came, had been brought up in the hacienda, the semi-feudal hacienda, where they're in, like slaves, where they had to be recept, 
negatively receptive, passively receptive in order to get on, to please the boss, and so on. Now, these people did not have the character structure to take advantage of the land they were given. And many of them, uh, against the law, rented out their land, took the money, and used it for drinking, and, uh, and uh, became the, the new uh, sugar refinery, became the new hacienda with a paternalistic role of taking advantage of these people. So in other words, the study showed that the revolution left the villagers supposedly in a state of equality, but a class system emerged quickly because of differences in social character. One of the most um, significant findings of the study, we independently looked at the character structure from questionnaires and Rorschach tests. And then we looked independently at the percentage of land that people planted in sugarcane versus in uh, products like rice and, and vegetables. It took a lot of work. While sugarcane, they had very little work. They brought in uh, low-level workers to do the d tough work, and they sat back. And we could show a significant, highly significant correlation between character structure and the actual farming behavior. Another major finding of the study had to do with the relationship between the sexes. In the most successful marriages, husbands and wives shared a productive, hoarding social character. They were hardworking, conservative, church-going, very supportive of each other, both working hard with different roles, <clears throat> the men in the fields, the, <clears throat> the women raising animals around the uh, house and the family. However, in the dysfunctional families, where husbands and wives were fighting each other, there was a war, war between the sexes. They had different characters. The men tended to have the unproductive receptive traits which, and, and were very dependent on their mothers. And to compensate for this, they acted very macho, very tough. The women they married were often much tougher, hoarding personalities who would ridicule the men. And the men would get furious. They would drink to feel powerful. They would they could become violent. So uh, you could see, if you really wanted to understand alcoholism and violence, you had to understand the history, the social character, the relationship between the sexes. You can't just pick out, you can't just look psychologically. You have to look at the whole system socio-economic, historical, psychological. You know, the typical fights that broke out were because of drunken insults about a person's masculinity or about his mother. And there's a Mexican joke that says two men are in a bar, they start drinking. First of all, one says to the other, I am your friend, soy... To amigo, then he says, uh, I'm your brother, soy tu hermano. Then he says, I'm your father, <laughs> soy tu padre. Bang, bang. <laughs> A number of studies that use Fromm's theory of social character have expanded understanding of personality and motivation beyond the study we did. And soon after its publication, the concepts and finding of the book were applied to a study of village women sponsored by the American Association of Advancement of Science. Uh, and I was a member of an advisory group that included the, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead. The study of village women explored why women in Kenya, Mexico, and the Philippines either have many children or limit the number of children 
they have a very important question. In two Mexican villages that were studied by Dr. Sonia Hoffman, who's sitting right here, uh, a Mexican psychoanalyst, she found social character combined with economic factors explained the findings concerning fertility. One village called Santa Maria was very much like the village we studied, perhaps with even more psychopathological environment, very much a former hacienda. People with men with receptive, unproductive social characters. By the way, I mean, you could see some of the, the same kind of findings if you look at problems of African Americans in the United States in violence and alcoholism. If you look at what happened in Ireland with the British conquest of the Irish, uh, some of these same patterns uh, are clearly explanatory. And they also suggest you don't solve these problems in simplistic ways. Within these families, the men tried to dominate their wives by force. Both parents treated their children as exploitable property. The men saw these, these uh, sons particularly as people who could go to the United States and make money and send it home or fight their wars for them. And the women saw the uh, sons as, as some people who would protect them against the husband, or since there was so much violence, uh, they needed to have more children around because they expected some of them to be killed. Now, in, and, and you could see the whole institution of this very receptive society wanting government money, wanting people to give them things, a lack of responsibility, a lack of self-determination. In contrast, the other village called Tierra Alta was no richer than Santa Maria, even had less land, but it had never been a hacienda. The women su supplemented their income by raising animals through the cottage industry of sewing. Their economic independence allowed them to challenge traditional authority. But their economic activity could not be separated from character and values. You know, there was, there was still some war between the sexes, but it, but it was um, carried out in a much more respectful way was open, acknowledged, tempered by values of human respect. But bringing women into the new economy strengthened their ability to limit their families and the village's capacity to adapt to change. In other words, what happened was the women, once the women were independent, they decided to have fewer children, both in order to have enough money to give them education and also to to keep them their own independence, so they weren't completely dominated by having a huge family. And the women said they wanted to practice birth control in order to be free to enjoy life more, or to have resources to provide for their children. So, uh, you know, these these findings, this kind of difference, has held up many studies. That's why uh, many of the agencies uh, of aid recognize that the best way you're going to limit the population in a healthy way is to educate women and give them economic independence. Now, uh, Dr. Hoffman, together with Dr. Salvador Mian, who is also here, have continued to work studies of social character in Mexico and, and uh, trained a number of students who continue this work. Now, when I returned with my family to the United States in 1968, I joined with Eric Fromm in opposing the Vietnam War and working to support the presidential campaign of Senator Eugene McCarthy, which was against the war. 
Now, Fromm and I constructed a little survey uh, to compare attitudes of people in terms of how life-loving or biophilic they were versus attitudes that were that were much more uh, controlling, anti-life, um, rigid. We found statistical evidence that a person's deep-rooted emotional attitudes could be more important than social class or identification with a political party in predicting the political positions on war and peace. In other words, when you get to the kind of crises of life or death, you find the character of Trump's political position or these kinds of identifications. After the election, I began a series of studies of leadership, and I organized projects to improve the quality of working life in the United States, the United Kingdom, and Sweden, working both with companies and their unions. All of these projects made use of concepts learned while working with Fromm. The research questions I asked were, one, what are the values and social character of the leaders in the forefront of developing the new information technology that's changing the mode of production in the most advanced countries? Do these leaders care about the impact of what they produce on people and on the environment? That was question one. Question two, what is the social character of followers and what motivates them to follow a leader? As, as you put, Dr. as Mr. Schleitz pointed out, love is one of them. But I, in fact, see five elements that are crucial. I call them the five R's. One are the reasons. Why are we doing this? What difference does it make? Two, what are the responsibilities I have? Do they connect with my talents? Do they connect with my values? I mean, teachers are motivated by teaching. Uh, doctors are motivated by curing. Third, the relationships. And that's where, where love comes in, caring. What are the relationships? Fourth, recognition. People need to feel their contributions are recognized. And then we get five rewards, which I find actually it probably is the least important in motivating people uh, in jobs except for the lowest level of job which have no meaning or no relationship. I, found, I, I don't have time really to summarize all the work done in, in factories, offices, and so on. So I leave that. You can look at my books. But... Um, I will say I found three types of leaders. One, one type, and this is within, particularly in the most advanced mode of production of knowledge work, technology. One, one type is extremely competitive marketing personality. They, they lead change to beat the competition. They will shape decisions for the benefit of people in the environment only if forced to by government regulation pressure from unions, or for customers. As one of them said to me, we know how to win at this game of business. It's up to you to make the rules. We can win at any game society can invent. The second type are productive narcissists who are motivated to change the way people live and work. Some want to improve life, even care about the environment. Others care only for their power and glory. The leader, these leaders have succeeded only when they've been able to partner with colleagues who complement their abilities. And I, you know, one, one dramatic example is Steve Jobs of Apple. The first time he was the CEO, his arrogance and lack of care about people got him thrown out of the company. He came back and learned to partner with, with people in production and, and design and so on, and the result was a great success of that company. So, uh, I mean, the point is, 
the narcissistic personality of the leader can be something creative in certain people. It can be a Nelson Mandela, or it can be something very destructive like an Adolf Hitler or a Stalin or uh, people who are, want to change the world just for pure power. The third type is more productive. Their purpose is to improve life, and they've been able to develop an organization as a collaborative community. And we, uh, my uh, colleagues and I have described some of these people in a recent book uh, called Transforming Healthcare Leadership, a systems guide to improve patient care, decrease costs, and improve population health, where we looked at really the best healthcare organizations, what they do, how they succeed in terms both of the patient, of cost control, and of, make, of taking their learning into the population and improving population Types of followers. Now, Fromm from was really prescient. He, he predicted the shift from an industrial to a service mode of production that was changing the social character. And he first wrote about the marketing character in 1947. And still, at, at that time, still, it was more, much more an industrial society. Today, most work in advanced societies have become service. 84% of work in the United States, 74% in Germany. Germany still has more industrial work than many of the other advanced. Uh, France and UK, much more in the 80% level. But not only has the work changed, the whole structure of the family has changed. If you think about in the, in the peasant society, you see the structure of the paternalistic society, roles are clear, they are unchanging. You look at the bureaucratic society, mostly men uh, are running things, the women are at home taking care of the, of the family, very different attitudes and values. Now you look at the emerging society today, in the United States, when uh, I was brought up, there were about 75% of families were headed by a single male wage earner. Today, there are fewer of those families than families headed by a single woman. And the, uh, the dominant family are two wage earners. How many people in this room were born into a family in which there was a single male wage earner? Only the father. How many people are in such a family right now? So, you, what we just saw is history. Now, if you look at what happened, the difference between a child growing up in that family where the woman represents caring, family, the man represents hierarchy, values, moving up the ladder, and a family today where both parents represent authority, they have to trade off, the kids are growing up uh, with what I call an interactive social character. One thing that's true, uh, and also a total um, a new attitude towards authority, towards technology, towards work. Uh, many of them have, today, children early on are in daycare centers. They have to learn interpersonal skills. Many of their close... They don't have the same um, strong emotional ties only with the parents. Many of them have stronger emotional ties with their peers. They look for people, they look at their parents, not so much authorities, but as service providers. They're the people who take us to play dates, to uh, training, to uh, courses. They recognize their parents are feeling guilty because they're not at home with them, so they know they can negotiate and they can get what they want from their parents by playing on their guilt. So it's a, they are learning kinds of skills they're bringing into the workplace that are very different, a whole social character. And, and uh, for the past 10 years, I've, I've created a questionnaire that gets at the difference between bureaucratic and interactive social character, and we have done... Uh, tests on it, and uh, very significant. Uh, the questionnaire works uh, uh, giving validity. Um, 
And uh, uh, tests have been run by Dr. Tim Scudder, who's here. Now, Dr. Scudder also heads a company called Personal Strengths Publishing. And this is a company that was built by Dr. Elias Porter, who developed something called the Strengths Deployment Inventory based on Fromm's character types. Now, Porter, Porter believed that the usefulness of the Frommian types, or the Freudian types for that matter, were limited because people didn't like the terms. They, found the, they, found, they didn't want to be called erotic or receptive or obsessive or hoarding. Um, or narcissistic or exploitative. Matter of fact, Margaret Mead once said to me the problem with Fromm's types is they sound very moralistic. Um, and what Porter did is would change, change them into colors, using colors so that the, the, the blue is the receptive, erotic, and the green is the more obsessive, and the red is the more, more exploitative. And he not only... Uh, he not only had tests to get at their, motivation, their dominant motivational system, but he also showed that, this pers that personality can shift in conflict and that the more people understand themselves and others and how they change in conflict, the better able they are to create good dialogue to avoid, to avoid unnecessary conflict uh, and, and to be, create a more collaborative organization. Now, this, this, uh, these tests have been given to over 2 million employees in over 1,000 companies, universities, government agencies in six continents. Statistical tests of construct and differential validity have supported the scientific validity of, these, of this theory of character types. Now, what remains to be tested? Fromm did not recommend that people develop the social character of their culture. He saw the social character as a formula for adaptation and success within a particular culture. It is not a recipe for happiness. To the contrary, it may cripple a person's capacity for growth. Fromm wrote about the pathology of normalcy, However, he recognized that it takes effort and awareness to transcend the social character. He once said to me, you know, the question isn't why someone is insane. The real question is, given the irrationality of life, why is anyone sane? The answer is that people stay sane by conforming. Most people, if they were not conforming with the social character. They weren't brought together by the social character. They would be uh, dri driven by all kinds of irrational drives and motivations. The social character keeps them sane at the expense of full human development and the pursuit of happiness. Fromm once said to me, you know, you look at pe people's psyche, it's, it's as though we are, have a mansion of 30 rooms and we're living in three of them. Fromm sought to understand both the nature of human development and its perversion to psychopathology. His theories are not, not only Freudian, but they integrated Aristotle's emphasis on productiveness, Spinoza's understanding of internal freedom, and the Judeo-Christian lessons on love and wisdom. Now, in the heart of man, Fromm presents a model of human development and psychopathology that he elaborates in that book and then in others. He proposes that the best solution to human existence is love, expressed in the love of the stranger and in love of life, biophilia, combined with individuation, which implies a humanistic conscience, a heart that listens. This theory is not only testable, but there is evidence supporting it in the conclusions of Dr. George Valiant in his book, Triumphs of Experience, that came out recently. He, did a, he took over a study 
75 years of a group of Harvard graduates over the period of their lives. They looked at everything. They looked at their, their success, their wealth, their, their um, uh, health. And they came to, he came to the conclusion there was only one thing that correlated with happiness of all the things they were testing. And here's a quote from Valiant. There are two pillars of happiness revealed in the 75-year-old study of Harvard graduates. One is love. The other is finding a way of coping with life that does not push love away. So, you're right. <laughs> in contrast, from view Psychopathology either is a loss of freedom and conformity, sadomasochism, addiction, and dependency, or perversion of transcendence and destructiveness, the extreme being necrophilia and attraction to what's dead, the impulse to destroy all that is spontaneous, free, and alive. Unlike Freud, who posited a destructive death instinct from viewed love and collaboration as primary human strivings. He viewed destructiveness as a perversion. Now Mauricio Cortina, who's here, has presented evidence from anthropology and attachment theory that supports Fromm's views. He also, Dr. Cortina, has also shown how social character can be understood as a necess necessary element in creating collaboration throughout human evolution. Fromm believed that societies and organizations could shape the social character in either a positive and negative or negative direction. His book, The Sane Society, proposed positive models. In our book, we describe Nuestros Pequeños Hermanos, a home for orphaned and abandoned children, our little brothers and sisters. It was founded in 1954 by a priest, Father William Wasson, whose purpose was not only to provide a home for the children, but also to develop them as productive and caring citizens. To achieve this, he established a family, not an institution, based on the, on the love, agape, really the love uh, that is a knowledge of kind of love Fromm writes about in The Art of Loving, with values of security, including education, to prepare the children for the future, work, all children work, all children take responsibility, even little children are contributing, um, and responsibility, acting not from rules, but from the heart, from a humanistic conscience. I have, I keep work, I've been working now for 60 years with this organization, working with the leaders, now we are going from starting with just a few children in Mexico. We are in nine countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have a pediatric hospital in Haiti that treated almost 100,000 children last year. Five of the nine countries are headed by former pequeños who were brought up there. Four, the other four homes are headed by uh, people who had been volunteers. By the way, some, many of our volunteers come from Germany, and we have a very, very active uh, uh, godparents from Germany, visitors from Germany. Uh, uh, we have our headquarters in Karlsruhe. Um, so uh, NPH, really, and its graduates. By the way, the executive director is a former, uh, former Pequeño who has an MBA. Um, it demonstrates that a community based on humanistic values can develop the kind of social character that Fromm described in terms of human growth. You can look at it really as an ongoing demonstration of everything Fromm wrote about. To conclude, ongoing theorizing and research continues to increase our understanding of the nature of human instincts. The distinguished biologist E.L. Wilson theorizes that through natural selection, 
Humans have two genetically determined behavioral drives that sometimes clash. One is individualistic, the other is collaborative and altruistic. The logic of Williams Ar- Wilson's argument is that our altruistic genes tend to be fired up by threats to our identity group. It's very easy to get people to collaborate when they're threatened. It's very easy to get collaboration on a football team where you're facing somebody else. But it's not so easy when there's no threat, when it's not a matter of people that have to band together to survive. Wilson writes, humans are compulsive group seekers. We're tribal animals. We satisfy this need variously in families, organized religion, political groups, ethnic groups, sports clubs. So, uh, but generally the greatest collaboration comes either from a strong ideology or from threats. And when we see threats and ideology combined, we get things like the Sunnis and Shias murdering each other. Wilson's theories can expand our understanding of social character and its genetic roots. They do not contradict Fromm's theories of social and individual factors that lead to human development. Rather, they emphasize the importance of leadership that develops the kind of collaborative community that shapes a positive social character, one in which people collaborate to create rather than to destroy. And we could have a whole seminar just on that and what that takes, building on what we know and what we see. By building on Fromm's theory of social character, social scientists could expand our understanding of how different cultures develop their social characters and what it would take to shape a more humanly developed social character. But testing Fromm's theories requires a change in the dominant paradigms of the social sciences that favor reductionistic tests of cause and effect. I think Dr. Tysing said something of this. Fromm's theories are systemic. They connect, connect psychodynamic factors with society, culture, history, ideology, economy, and politics. Fromm gave us new truths that integrated his clinical observations and research with the theories of other humanistic theory thinkers and scientists. Yet it has not been widely accepted, even though it could increase understanding of human and economic development. The Frommian paradigm requires interdisciplinary work, but the institutions of the social sciences, academic departments, scholarly journals, they do not support this integration. I studied, when I got my doctorate at Harvard, there was a Department of Social Relations that combined psychology, sociology, and cultural anthropology integrated. Today, it no longer exists. It's gone back to the departments. I taught at uh, the Washington School of Psychiatry, which with Fromm work that started by Harry Stack Sullivan, who tried this integration, no longer there. The prevailing paradigm of the social sciences that claim to be value-free or define progress purely in material terms do not enable us to understand and address the problems that threaten humanity. For that, we need Fromm's rational and critical approach that evaluates events in terms of biophilic ethics and productive human development. For those of us who have appreciated Fromm's value-based scientific contributions, The challenge for us is to engage a new generation to understand and build on them. I think this conference is a good place to start. Thank you.